I'm Ben Gramico from InterNACHI, and this is a little presentation about um, an inspection overview and some business tips. I want to share with you some URLs. These are three important URLs. You can take a screenshot of this and visit them later, or you can email me or ask AJ for the URLs or something like that, but it's natchiorg slash contact. That's really important because there are 28 people that work at InterNACHI, full-time staff, and we're all working for you. It's an incredible resource that hardly is uh, taken advantage of. And that's what the, the power of being a member of InterNACHI is. You, we have benefits that you can take advantage of so you can become successful. Natchi.org slash webinars, that's where all of our webinars are. We're in a live one now. Um, if you can't make it to a live one, we video record everything. And then natchi.org slash podcast. Um, if you're on a beach listening or you're driving, doing an inspection, um, uh, enjoy listening to a, uh, a training session. We're going to inspect this house. I inspected this house. We're going to inspect it together. And we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to do a home inspection. I want to share my inspection day schedule, and we're going to talk about time management. Checklists and software. I'll show you a little bit about my software. Uh, standards of practice and inspection process. How to perform an inspection in about three hours and make a ton of cash. And we can talk about business and marketing and websites. Speaking of websites, if you don't have a website, it's really important to get online and start as soon as possible. And I recommend InterNACHI's vendor for building home inspector websites. They build websites for only InterNACHI members. And that's at nachi.org slash website, nachi.org slash website. And it's $2.99 and $16 a month. InterNACHI negotiated with this company, inspectorwebsitebuilder.com, to do the lowest price possible in the entire inspection industry and a great website. So if you need a website, start now. Here's my day. This is my actual day. This is my actual morning. Um, when we were rocking and rolling um, at my inspection company, we did two a day. But this is my morning schedule. And I'm showing you this so that you can figure out your day. And you have to manage your time. Because nobody wants to go to an eight-hour inspection. And nobody wants to wait 24 to 48 hours for their inspection report. You won't stay in business. You have to be efficient with your time. I'm not saying blow through the house and run and skip stuff. I'm saying inspect everything efficiently and I'll show you how. So this is my inspection day. I leave my house at seven, I'm back at five and I make about a thousand dollars if I do two inspections. If it's just one, I do it in the morning so I can do business and marketing in the afternoon, get my hard stuff done in the morning. I love morning inspections. I leave my house at seven, get to the job early when no one's there. I, knock, I walk up to the front door. I knock, introduce myself. I got my ID badge. I'm here to do an inspection. They're probably ready. They're going to complain a little bit that I'm early. I'm going to apologize. I'm going to say I'm going to start outside. You don't have to um, let me in until the real estate agents are here, right? And that'll be later. Okay. So the first thing I do is inspect the roof because I don't need my client there. And it's the most dangerous, most difficult thing because I get up on the roof. You're not required to get up on any roof, but I do. And we can talk about that as well. And then at eight o'clock, I'm done with the roof inspection. I'm walking down off my ladder. Maybe they see me on the roof while they pull into the driveway. That'd be really cool. And I shake their hand. I've got mints in my mouth, right? Fresh breath, big smile, first impression. This is your only chance to make a great impression with your client who hasn't met you yet. It's kind of weird. And shake your hand and pass out at least five business cards to everybody because they're going to, you want them to pass. You want them to be your marketing team after this. And you're going to pass out, they're going to they're pass out your business cards. And then you explain the condition of the roof and explain this, the process, which is I'm going to take you around the house if you'd like to follow me. And I'm going to tell you the story of your home. If we find a problem, I'll tell it to you. And that's about it. I'm going to do the exterior next. That's going to be about 15 minutes. I invite them along. Usually, they want to go in and do the important things 
which is like take measurements, take a look at the bathroom, see what kind of kitchen renovations are going to be done. You know, they're going to spend money on bling probably. And I'm going to try to convince them to spend money on like important things like insulation or uh, other, other th fixing problems that I find. Maybe the house is brand new and I can't find a single problem. I can't find a single problem in this inspection. Dang, a three hours, can't find anything wrong. That is incredibly valuable to my clients that I can't find anything wrong with this house. So it's not about finding problems and charging for the most problems, right? It's about providing information that's valuable to our clients, right? So if there's a ton of problems, if there's no problems, either way, it's gonna be about three hours and I'm gonna tell my clients the condition of the home, I'm gonna answer all their questions and I'm gonna manage my time because I'm a business owner and it's all about making money divided by your time. If you make $300 and you divide it by three hours, that's pretty easy math. If you make $300 and divide it by 10 hours, that's a different math, right? So you can take a screenshot of this or I can send it to you later. If you want the slide deck, I can give that to you. But as you can see at around 8.15, I wanna get 8.15, 8.30, I wanna be in the house and I wanna inspect the heavy systems. And I'm gonna spend about an hour and a half here, maybe two hours. And that's all the hard stuff right? Internet actually trains you on how to inspect these things. The HVAC, the plumbing, the water coming in and the water, the sewer going out, right? And the water heater, electrical and structure. When I'm done with that, I'm in the attic, if there is access, at about 10 o'clock. And if I'm in the attic at about 10 o'clock, I know I'm managing my time well, and I'm going to make money, and I'm out of here in about an hour. And I'm going to get lunch. I'm going to go to my next job if I have one scheduled right after lunch. I'm gonna eat while driving, being efficient with my time. I'm gonna do a 12 o'clock inspection and be home at five. And at the end of this inspection, 11 o'clock, I'm in the kitchen because I like to end in the kitchen. You can start in the kitchen, it doesn't matter. I like to end in the kitchen, review, get paid, shake hands, leave a little candy, uh, a little peach candy for everybody. And I'm getting paid not only for a home inspection, but for additional inspections. We call them ancillary or additional inspections, like a termite, a pool, a mold, a radon test. And that adds revenue, gross revenue. That's more, re it's one of the ways you can make more money as a home inspector. You sell more services per client and you bundle them. People love bundles, getting a discount on a bundle, right? And so I'm going to make about $500 on this one inspection. My client is going to be thoroughly happy. And it all starts at the standards of practice. Everything starts here. Everything starts here. This is, this is the most important document. You should know it by heart. There's a course on it, Internet Use Free Online Course. You got to take it to become certified. It could be an hour. It could be four hours long. It all, all depends. It's learn at your own pace. And this tells you what you're required to do and what you're not required to do. This actually helps reduce liability too. Like one of the main things from the standards of practice is that you don't have to find every problem. You're not required to find every problem in the house. You're not required to find every defect. Only the ones that are major, we call them material defects. And the observed ones. So you have to first see it, right? If there's a major defect above my head and I don't see it, it won't be in the report. And it has to be, I have to see it and it has to be deemed or considered a major problem. And then it'll be in the report. If I see something during an inspection and I, I think it's really a big problem, it has to be in the report. If it's not in the report, I've made a mistake. And so how do I do that? Well, I need a, a process. How do I not make mistakes? How do I know what to do in an efficient manner and not make mistakes and satisfy my client? It's all about the standards of practice and inspection process. The first thing I do, we can just visit the standards of practice. 
Let's go to the standards of practice. You should have a live link to this document because it's a live document. It sometimes changes. And the first system is roof. That's why I inspect the roof first. Kind of works out. I get there early and I do the roof inspection. It's, it's the first thing in the standards of practice as well. It's the first thing in my inspection report as well. And then exterior, that's the second thing. And then here's the big stuff, right? The hard, difficult things. It's going to take a lot of my time. And then at 10 o'clock, I'm at the attic. And then I do the interior. Let's go back to the inspection here. So I'm going to inspect the roof. And I, I use big, tall ladders. You don't have to in order to do this, to get up on the roof. You're not required to walk upon any roof surface. And remember, this is a 15 minute inspection. I'm gonna walk around, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at every plane or every surface. Uh, I'm not gonna get to any edge. I don't have to touch everything, but if I can, I'm gonna get close to it. And I'm gonna take pictures of just about everything so that everybody knows I've looked at everything. That, that's, I'm not gonna walk on that because that is steep. That's like an 812, uh, that's 412. I'm gonna walk around, that's the garage. and. There's the heating system and some kind of vent. And that's, I love that picture. I put those pictures. Hey, in my door. Yeah. Um, you say big, tall ladders. What ladders do you typically carry with you? Yeah, it's, uh, I, I like Louisville. So I like the 32 foot. It's really heavy and big. 28 foot. Uh, that's like similar, but they're different for me. I also <laughs> carried a 40 foot aluminum for barns. And that's just crazy to do. Don't do that. And then um, I had a 12 foot aluminum, real light things for ranchers, and then a step ladder and um, crawl gear to get into crawl spaces. But I always grabbed my 28 foot. It just seemed like perfect for me, but I wanted something heavier just to go a little bit higher. So the 32 foot felt really good. It's so heavy. I mean, when you put that in the ground, it just doesn't move. And um, it really all depends on how much coffee I drank in the morning. How, mu how much weight do I want to hump around the the house. So I love the fiberglass heavy ladders. And I tend to do something like this, which is, um, it's, this is not what you're supposed to be doing, but this is how I did it. So it's really up to you, right? I was trained. You got to do the three foot above the, the, the gutter edge, right. And strap it down. I love the gable side. So this is, I won't recommend this. This is how I did it, but I just want to show you. And then I'll put this in the, in the report as well so that um, people know that I, I carry tall ladders. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But you, if you and I were competing in the market and I was doing this ladder thing, getting up on the roof and showing everybody pictures like this, right? My hand touching the top of the roof. How would you compete? Maybe you do a drone, maybe do an extendable pole. Uh, maybe hire a roofer. Uh, drones are really great. Uh, 10 years ago, they weren't. They're, they're fantastic now. Uh, I got one. So this is a drone, DJI, DJI. Um, it's a mini. They keep changing the minis. I think it's a mini two. Oh, yeah, it's a mini two. It's a 4K camera. It's, uh, what is it? It's less than a half a pound in my hand. I scrunch it up. You can take it on an airplane if you want. Um, you have to be... You have to be a pilot. You have to take the exam. And we have a course on prepping you to take the exam. But I'd fly up if I was competing against me, zzz, zzz, take some pictures, come back down nice and safe. You can inspect a roof with 4K pictures, zoom in, zoom out, 4K video without leaving the ground. So if you don't want to get up on the roof, you're not even required to. You still can compete in the marketplace because really this is... Two things, it helps me become a home inspector, but I'm gonna use it to my advantage in order to compete with my friendly competitors. Yeah. I'm gonna put this picture on my website too. So this is Big Ben Inspections and you put stuff on websites in order to show off. So Big Ben Inspections, this was designed by that company that I mentioned before, natcha.org slash website. And if you scroll down, let's see, where am I? Oh, there's my picture, there's me on the roof. That's a picture of me on the roof. Here's a picture of me on the roof, right? So people know that I get up on the roof and I want them to see me getting up. I want them to see that I use infrared, right? That I use infrared cameras on every inspection, right? And basically here, here's what I, I'm gonna tell my clients how it works, how to maintain it and how to save energy. Gotta get a website. Let's see, I wanna get off track. I sometimes do that. Okay, so I'm back on the roof. 
I'm taking pictures of every system and every component. A roof covering, I'm not responsible for the, the underlayment, uh, the water shield, I saw water shield, the fastening, or the, the flashing that I can't see, the decking, the fastening. I can't, I'm not responsible for anything that I can't see. I'm just looking at these components. And this looks like, I don't want this to be a screened exhaust for a dryer because that's against code, against standard. Um, lint catches into, I don't think this is it. Usually it's circular or something else. This looks like just a vent in the attic. It's not really, you know, if it had squirrel problems or bird problems, it's not really tight either. Um, no big deal. That's from the heating system. I'm, I'm assuming we have now not a fireplace, wood burning fireplace, but like a natural gas, uh, propane or, or natural gas. I don't, I'm not worried about the, the rust, but I'm going to put my thumb on it and see if I can get something to crack or damage. There's flashing where I can see it. That's good. Uh, there's my truck and the, there's my van in the, in the picture. Gutters are clean. That's a nice gutter shot. I love putting those in the, in the report. I give all of my video and my pictures to my clients. Um, just some of them, about 30 pictures go in the report. Um, I kind of like this picture because I don't know if you noticed, but um, I hate it when a real estate agent just pulls up against my back bumper. I don't know why they do that. They just pull right there and there's no room for both of us, right? So uh, I need room to take my ladders off and on. So I bought a cone and that just saved a ton of time for me. So it's one of those tips. Get a nice big three foot cone. Uh, and this is the lower section of the roof in the back. And it looks good. Same thing. There's the roof vent. I can see flashing. So this is, this is a siding and this is flashing at the wall flashing. And this is flashing where that intersection is. And this is a nice, this is a really nice installation. You can just imagine, I think of rain You can just imagine water coming down the siding. Where's it going to go next? It needs to be kicked out. It needs kick out flat or flashing or head wall flashing, whatever you want to call this. And then what about these gaps in between the three tabs? Well, there needs to be flashing there, you know, and it's, it's really shingled away and it, it diverts water away. And I'm looking at those sections where two different materials meet because they may flex differently in the sun or winter or, or may, may not be touching properly or two contractors not communicating on how their materials need to work with each other. You know, a house is a system of interdependent parts, each part affecting another. The roofer can't just say, well, I don't know about the siding. Oh, yes, you do. It has to be flashed with the siding along this wall. I can see the step flashing. I'm not responsible to inspect all the flashing, but if I see something missing and I deem it to be big defect, I'd have to put it in the report. I'm not concerned about the shed uh, paint. There's the air conditioner from bird's eye view, another gutter shot. I'm just taking pictures with my camera and it's digital pictures and digital video. That's just free stuff. So I'm just taking pictures of anything. I think my clients like it when I, I put my hand on something, you know, and I'm inspecting things. Next thing is the exterior. So I'm down on the ground. First impression, uh, there's the real estate agent wondering what I'm going to do and um, meet my clients and uh, ready to go on to the next system. And I'm on the ground at eight. So it feels like, ah, oh, I've done the roof. And I've actually um, done the inspection report as well. If I'm handy with technology, I'm going to share this. Let's see if I can do this. Ready? I want to show you. Um, so this is, I use Spectora. Spectora is a um, home inspection software. And this is my uh, Spectora app. And um, Spectora actually has my template in the template community, if you want. And so these are the systems that I'm going to inspect. And there's roof, and a little reminder about um, uh, um, the roof. And there's the roof covering, and a little thing about homeowners, and then it's asphalt. And if I wanted to you know, take a picture, I could, I, and just see if I can snap a pic. Oh, wait a minute, Let's see if I can do this, it's fun. Okay, then I take a picture. I'm gonna use that in my report. And I inspected it from the ground, or maybe I, I did it both, ground and ladder, and uh, there's limitations. And if there was a problem with the roof, like cracked roofing material, I would just tap that top sentence. I observed cracked damaged shingles prone to leaking, and maybe I could also take um, a picture of the problem. And then I just take a picture of the problem, and here's my 
my coffee cup, right? We should all have a coffee cup like this. So that's in there. I take a picture of that. And so, yeah. And so that's um, the software that I use in order to be efficient. Because when I'm on the ground right here at about eight o'clock, not only have I inspected the house, the roof, but I've also written the roof section in the report. The report of that system is written. So when at the end of the home inspection, I've actually written, written the entire report with pictures and video if I wanted to. And I'm ready at the end of the inspection to share a summary of the major defects that I found during the inspection. That, that simple thing of using good software that allows you to write while you inspect using a mobile device and provide a summary at the end, that beats probably a lot of your competition. Some of your competition, you know, they haven't been trained like that yet. They're not doing that yet. Maybe um, they do, it's an old dog, new tricks kind of thing. Clients and real estate agents now expect you to have a summary quickly. The report, the entire report, which no one reads, can be done 24 hours later, but you really should be able to summarize something at the end of the inspection and provide something for the real estate agent to use like a checklist because they're on a different path than you. You're there to educate your client. They're trying to get the home to closing and they have what? You found eight things, eight problems. Okay, let's see how we can negotiate these away or get them fixed before they move in or, or something. They need that checklist. Give that real estate agent what they need. Give your clients what they need. And then that's a valuable service. Okay. So I'm going to do the exterior. I'm just going to go through real quick. The, the downspouts are discharging far away from the house. There's plenty of clearance. There's a nice slope away. This could be discharged away, but it's just a patio. Who cares? And this is good. It could be discharged away here a little bit more. It's a small recommendation, very minor. Homeowner can do it. I don't really inspect the trees and the yard, and that's the neighbor's pool. But I'll take a look at things. And then really, I'm looking at the exterior. Final sighting looks good. I don't see any problems. But I'm going to take a picture, a ton of pictures of a lot of things. And from here, I can see a little bit of paint on the concrete uh, tread and a step and a little bit of paint there. No big deal. But I'll take a pic. I'll put it in the report where two materials meet differently. Sometimes the, there's an opening that needs to be sealed. Okay. This all, all looks good. Uh, that could be a whole, I don't care. It's very minor, minor things. It all depends on what you got to gauge your client too. If they're very picky, maybe they want you to make comments on cosmetic defects. Cosmetic defects are like blemishes. Um, there's a stain on the carpet. Um, there's a, a bump in the drywall. Who cares, right? I'm really there to find problems. There's the high efficiency heating system. So I know I have a, an exhaust, uh, a high efficiency heating system. There's the intake and exhaust pipe there. Um, that's a defect, um, minor, um, could be fixed by a plumber. Um, it should be frost-free hose bib. They call them hose bibs or spigots um, and, and should be frost-free in, in this climate. This is Pennsylvania, by the way. And so the structure underneath, I can't see everything. If I can't see it, you know, I don't know what's going on down below. This, it, you know, is this going through? Is it on resting? Is this wood resting on concrete? Ideally, it'd be off. So I'm going to tap it with my screwdriver. My screwdriver is in my vest. This is the, one of the handy things. I don't know if you can see it. That's my screwdriver there. It's like a six and one. So you can have flathead or Phillips and different kinds of things. And if you wanted to take off a, a, some, a like a jacket, on the furnace, you can use the, the, the thinning there. Or, you know, just tap the bottom of everything that comes in contact, especially wood in contact with concrete, wood in, near the ground. All exterior receptacles are GFCI protected. There's a shed, I could care less what's inside it, but it looks like the dryer passes through the shed and then exhausts in a screen. That's, that's really funny. So we can't have a dryer exhausting into a screen, it'll clog with lint and catch on fire. No big deal, it's very easy to replace. There's the natural gas meter, shut off valve. You're required to identify where to shut off the gas. And that goes into the house. There's electric meter. I don't like all this stuff. 
um, you know, it looks like it's just gooped with a lot of, um, I don't want water to go through here. I, I think there was some kind of old electrical meter or panel or something like that here and they removed it and they, they just have some open gaps there. Um, grounding, electrode, and, and the rod is there. There's my hand. And I'm looking for problems with the siding, light fixtures. There's the paint again. These are all very minor things. Another spigot that needs to be frost proof. A new GFCI. They probably did that before I, I came. There's the air conditioning unit. Take a picture of the minor rust at the top. Who cares? Uh, uh, the the um, the manufacturing label, there's electric disconnect, nice space. There's the crack in the driveway, no big deal, it could be sealed up. These are very minor things. The public walk, where the driveway is, no trip hazards. I'll take a look. It's not required that I inspect sidewalks, but I will because I'm there. And there's no trip hazards here at all the walks. The next thing is heating. And this is where the difficult part is. Roof, exterior, I'm done inspecting. I've taken pictures. The report for those two systems is done. I know I'm I'm going into the house at about 8.30. Um, that's pretty good. There's the heating system. Kind of weird. And they, they cut out access panel. Looks really ugly, but that's okay. As long as I can get to it and remove the front. And I know it's high efficiency because the burner chamber is sealed. And I've got a plastic exhaust pipe. I don't like this flexible gas line. It should be solid. And there's the draft inducer fan, and this is the exhaust going out. So I just want to identify a few things, right? Draft inducer fan, there's the blower fan down here. Service switch, electric service switch. You know, I, I use that when inspecting the heating and air conditioning system, you know, to turn it off and on and use the thermostat. I want to see the burners turn on. I don't need to heat up the entire house. I'm not taking a Delta T temperature thing. I'm not heating up everything. I just want to see the flames come on and off. And I want to hear the air conditioner come on and off. And there's the gas shut up valve. And that's a defect. You learned about that in the class. And there's the components. I mean, basically, a system is made up of components. And InterNACHI's courses and training classes teach you about every component of the system. So you take a picture of the system, like from far away. And then midway, you get up closer and you kind of identify the components, and then I like to touch each component and take a picture of it. It forces me to inspect and touch everything, and um, I don't miss anything. And if I do, my software is here, and it's going to back me up. So if I go back into my software, so it, here's here's my. I don't know if you can see it. I don't want to share my screen again. That was too much, but but it tells me like here's the heating system, and I go through it. I scroll through it, and it tells me what to inspect. Here's the heating method, and what are my limitations, and do I have missing air filters or not, and any other problems. Now that's really cool. Like I don't have to worry about what do I inspect. It's in my hand. Here's the thermostat location. I'm supposed to identify according to the standards practice the thermostat location, and it's in my hand now. I don't I don't have to. Remember, what am I supposed to do with the heating system? You know, it's right there. I look smart when I when I have an inspection process and standard in my hand, right? And I can even leave myself little notes for the next time. I can tweak my report writing, my narratives, my sentences as I inspect so that I'm better next time too. So having software in your hand helps you become efficient with your time. And it's about time management, remember? About 300, about whatever, five, seven, eight hundred thousand thousand dollars divided by your time. It's that fraction. You want that top numerator of the fraction to be as fat as possible. Internet actually helps you increase gross revenue in various ways. You can make a lot of money, but if you stink at managing your time, you'll be out of business, right? You have to manage your time. And one of the best ways is to have software that works in your hand. Okay, so I'm going through, there's the air filter, there's the air conditioning unit, sump pump, um, you know, discharges outside, condensate pump, condensate pump, not sump pump. And that discharges, and there's the exhaust pipe, and then water heating equipment. It's called water heating equipment or water heater. 
um, called an appliance that's confusing to clients. Hot water source is another one, but the standards of practice calls it water heating. A code calls it a water heating equipment or a water heater. I think it's chapter, oh, there it is. Here's the code, the 2021 IRC chapter 28. I think it's called water heaters. And the internet sheet calls it water heating equipment. Same thing. And it, you're required to inspect this system. And this system is not difficult to inspect. It's a system. It's a probably, let's, let's go here. I think we're going to look at the hot water tank. And I just want to make the point that a system is a set of parts. So if you learn what the parts are, you put them all together. And a defect, if you know what their function is and what they're supposed to be looking like, then a defect really just pops out. At you. So let me show you what a defect at a hot water tank looks like if you're following the standards of practice. Here's a system. It's the water heating equipment or water heater or hot water source. Those terms are great. I inspect the bottom. Is it leaking? That's the number one thing. Is this tank leaking? If, if this is on the basement floor, there's it, the floor isn't going to be damaged. It feels on the first floor. I'd want a pan underneath to catch it. Feels in the attic for sure. I want a big pan to catch it with drainage pipes and, and backup drainage. This is on the basement floor. It's not going to really ruin anything. Maybe get the carpet wet if it leaks, but I'm still going to recommend a pan. Okay. Hot water tank. There's the gauge. Don't touch it. Don't light it. Don't turn anything on. You don't have to turn anything on. You don't have to activate anything. You don't light a pilot. And there's the, these are terrible pictures, but that's the manufacturing label. It shows the size of the tank. I think it's a 40 gallon tank. Cold water coming in through a shutoff valve, hot water going out. There's gas going in through a valve. There's exhaust gases going out. And we saw that chimney stack, which is shared by the HVAC system. And we saw that on the roof. And there's the system there with the components. And the last component is a TPR valve, the temperature pressure relief valve. It should be extended to the floor. I inspected every component because I had my checklist in my hand. And this is the last thing. There are actually 14 requirements to the TPR discharge pipe itself. You don't have to remember that stuff. You can just put it in your software. This obviously is not extended to the floor and it should be. If it discharges, it's going to discharge really hot scalding water and hurt somebody. That's the other thing you do. We try to help our clients, our neighbors, Stay safe in their homes. They should be healthy homes. They should be safe homes. So if you see something like this, it's an easy fix. You don't have to throw out red flags and hoop and holler. Um, it's really just an easy fix. So it's a defect, but easy fix. Plumbing, water coming in. What I like to do underneath a meter or a valve is to check to see if it's leaking by touching it and wiping it with my hand. This is one of the best water leak detectors ever invented. Um, if not, you can use one of these things. This is a good one too. So this is, um, this is a water meter as well, or you know, a, a sensor to see if something is leaking. And let's see, it'll, it'll give me like, a, like an audio and a visual indicator. And I like it because you know, it can extend out three feet and I can also touch the ceiling or touch the floor and I'm not measuring anything. I just wanna know if it's if this thing thinks it's wet. That's all I really wanna know, right? You can also use infrared. You know, infrared sees temperatures of things. And usually when there's a, a water leak or groundwater coming in, groundwater is like 55 degrees. You can see if it's cool down in the basement or if a roof leak or, or maybe something's overheating, it'll tell you the temperature of things and that'll be, this, these make you a better inspector. And to get to the point where you have you know, this toolbox, tool bag of really cool tools, you have to make some money. So I also um, want to help you get to the point where you're making money, like $500 in a, in a nice morning, four-hour morning, right? Okay, so let's see. Um, Scott says, what's the name of the software you use? Uh, Spectora. But if you want recommendations from me about other software, I've used a lot of them. Feel free to email me. 
Oh, Ken says, I do use uh, Spectora. Awesome, awesome. Okay. And also, if you're new to Spectora and you want a discount code, I've got discount codes too to use them. Or if you're um, talking to a new software company or a vendor in the industry, you want to buy a, a flashlight or an infrared camera, make sure you tell them, uh, ask them for the InterNACHI membership discount, right? InterNACHI helps members keep money in their pockets. We're a huge organization and we talk to all the vendors and we ask them to provide discounts to our members because we're so big. So that's one of the benefits of joining InterNACHI. You want to take advantage of the membership benefits. It's like discounts on things. Okay, the next section is the basement. And I know it's finished, so it actually makes my job easier. If it's finished, I can't see anything. And if it's filled with a bunch of stuff, personal items, that's good too. But I'm going to grab my flashlight and I'm going to take a look around in the nooks and crannies and I'm going to take a picture of me looking in certain areas. So if anybody has any problems like, oh, this area was wet, this area could leak. There could be a rainstorm the day after my inspection and this could be a big puddle area. And if I have a picture of this area, I can show you my client or anyone else, the contractor, that at the time of the inspection, this was the condition, right? There's no puddle, there's no water. I have my flashlight here, there's no stains. So anything can happen after my inspection and I'm not responsible for it. Wow, this is starting to get a lot of fun. I'm having fun with my clients, right? I know the needs of the real estate agent. I know the needs of my client. I'm making a lot of money, right? I'm showing my passion. I'm adding value. And I'm not responsible for future events. I'm responsible to find problems. And if something breaks in my hand, I'm not responsible for that either. I just take a picture of it. Now I've got very few worries being a home inspector. I have all of these resources that InterNACHI provides to be a successful home inspector. And I'm making a ton of cash. It's a, one of the best jobs I've ever had. And I've dug sewer lines with a shovel and backhoe operator and delivered newspapers when I was a little kid. And this is the best thing. I build houses. Being a home inspector is really a lot of fun. Really a lot of fun. But you have to have some basic business knowledge as well, like time management. I can't see above ceiling tiles, but I'll move them. I'll move them away a little bit and shine a flashlight. I'll even touch things with my hand. This all looks really good. This is nice and dry. I don't see any watermarks. This is all looking really great. I'm not responsible for this. This is a pool chain here, right? No light bulb. I don't care. You know, the transformer is probably for the doorbell. You know, kind of fun to find that. I thought it was neat. Like, it's like one in a million to find the transformer for the doorbell. Just taking a picture with your camera above the, above the ceiling drop tile. And there's no water here, you know. And I use, there. there's my picture. I use this sensor, you know, to probe through the carpeting and padding and touch the floor um, to see if it's wet. If it's wet, it'll, it'll tell me. So I move that around. I take pictures because it looks good. It could be wet. Sometimes it is. I mean, sometimes it looks like that and it's actually wet, right? And nobody knows. So I'll use that and I'll use my infrared. If it's wet, groundwater, it's probably a cool, it'll look blue. If you're using like that kind of color in your imagery. Yeah, and there's like all kinds of nooks and crannies. I'm hoping like I can find some termite tubes right there. That'd be really cool. You know, maybe termites, because this is the concrete, this is ground, this is the sill plate, and like this is a perfect area for a termite tube right there, you know? So I'm just looking for things as much as possible. It's so fun. A home inspection is like grabbing both of your hands and tying them behind your back and looking around, you know? That's why you're not responsible for everything. You can't be responsible for everything with your hands tied behind your back, right? You're just observing. It's a visual only inspection, but you get to use normal operating controls. You can open up the garage door if you wanted to. And smoke detectors, you know, test them. They're always old and not working. Representative number of wall receptacles, representative number of light fixtures. And that representative number is defined by the home inspector. So it could be one per room, you know? And then I got the garage and I've got two garage door openers. I'm gonna open and close each one. 
and they have the sensor, right? And I'm gonna trip them. So if you're at the House of Horrors, I think we got two garage doors. Uh, they're really fun to inspect, right? Test them, make sure that they work, see how they work, right? There are two different kinds of garage door openers in the House of Horrors. Um, this is hardwired in there. And that's a, it's gonna be a problem one of the House of Horrors. I think one of them has an extension cord. Um, so you don't want a, a temporary extension cord used for permanent use. All receptacles in the garage, all of them need to be GFCI protected. And there's that's a nice setup there. And again, inspection restrictions. I love to take pictures of inspection restrictions. I can't see everything, you know? So there's that, there's that. I can't see everything. There's that. Well, wait, what, what is that? So you get a little bit closer, right? Oh, there's a hole in the wall. Okay, that was nice. I think maybe, you know, they had the chair there and this board there and they could have like hit it very easily. Sometimes that happens. They want to hide things from me. But um, I don't know if that was, but that looks like a bumper went way too far into the house. You can't have breaches in the barrier. This is a firewall. You can't have any holes in this firewall. Sometimes fires happen in the garage and move through the barrier that's supposed to be there and into the house. These are rated walls, rated for about 30 minutes that allows the fire company to come into the garage and put things out before the fire goes through the wall. Now, if there's a hole, that's not fire. No, that fire will go right in there, probably go up into the uh, stud uh, bay chase and go to the second floor or into the attic and then really spread. Um, so you don't want any, you want to look at the ceiling and the walls of a garage and make sure there aren't any openings, no damage, no water. And that door needs to be fire rated as well. Electrical. I'll go through this. Here's the electrical panel. You're not required to remove the dead front. It's really dangerous if you do. Um, don't, this isn't high voltage with arcs, but it, there could be something. You never know. Like there could be the wrong type of <laughs> screw at the panel. Now this screw can cause you problems. It could give you a shock. It could puncture a live wire. It could short things out. It could spark all that kind of stuff. It has to be flat. So what I do is I carry, uh, I don't have them in my pocket. I carry, um, uh, you'll know a panel uh, screw because it has a flat head. So it doesn't puncture a live wire. Um, that would be bad. And I remove the dead front. Again, you're not required to. And I take a look around. I'm basically looking for an, a big fat breaker on a thin gauge wire. Like a common defect is a 20 amp breaker on a 14 gauge wire. That's that's too big of a breaker. There are come some other comments I can make here, but you'll get to them in, in your training. I'm just looking for anything melted as well, or maybe sprayed with paint or a mouse that got caught in the panel because it's warm and it all looks good. So no big deal. I'll take a look at the, the panel rating and the manufacturing label. Laundry, that's not specifically listed in the standards of practice. Um, bathrooms, the word bathrooms aren't specifically, you know, the word kitchen isn't in the standards of practice, but basically you take the plumbing and electrical and you put it all together and you inspect the laundry or the kitchen. And your clients are going to assume you're going to inspect the laundry and the kitchen and things like that. So even though it's not the standards of practice, I inspect the laundry as a part of my inspection and the laundry tub. And every receptacle in the laundry now is GFCI protected. And that dryer vent goes outside through the shed and into a screen. That's no good. And that's the laundry. Attic. Ah. It's about 10 o'clock. I did those heavy things. The panel was in the garage, so I had to find the electrical panel. The electrical panel was that heavy thing in between 8.15 and 10 o'clock. It was one of the HVAC plumbing coming in, plumbing going out, electrical and, and hot water source and structure. So I did all that. I found the electrical panel in the garage, so I had to inspect the garage, right? And next to the garage was the laundry, so I inspected the laundry. It was through the laundry, right? So I might as well inspect all those things. I put in a report. I don't care where I am in the house. I've got software in my hand. I could just jump to any system and inspect it and be ready to go. But I want to be here, member, in my schedule at about 10 o'clock, 10.15 latest. Where am I going? 
I'm going at 11 o'clock. I want to finish all this up and get paid with a 100% five-star rated satisfied customer and agents. So when I'm here, 10 o'clock, I'm giddy happy. I know I'm managing my time as a good business owner and I'm going to make some money. And the rest of it is easy. It's all literally downhill from now. You know, I'm coming down into the kitchen. That's where I'm heading. There's, there's always a smile on my face when I get into the attic. I don't care how odd it is because I know I'm doing well. This is not good, right? Like disheveled, pushed away insulation in order to throw some boards down just for storage. I mean, maybe clean up the garage or something or, you know, add another shed. But you don't need to, to crunch thick insulation in order to get storage. Now, you, in my house, I built an elevated storage floor in my attic. So I had 12 inches of insulation underneath the storage floor in the attic, right? This is crushing trusses. So here's a truss. This is truss built. Truss built, truss built. And this is three and a half inches. And that bottom cord is only three and a half inches thick. So I know that they've crushed this really thick insulation. They threw it out and crushed it down to three and a half inches. And it's not even that thick because they crushed this 12 inch into three and a half inches. Now there are no air pockets. It's all just compressed. This second floor of the house is like a different environment. It's a different climate zone. Everyone's complaining in the wintertime, I bet, of how cold it is. And the heating and cooling bill is way whack. This is a great opportunity to help my client understand the condition of the home and to save energy and to give them uh, options on what they can do in order to be comfortable in their home. That's another thing. It has to be healthy, safe, and comfortable, and energy efficient, and everything working well, all that good stuff. You have a great value. Home inspectors are, are incredibly value, valuable to homeowners. Fan turned on. I got that to turn on. There's some kind of vent coming out of the kitchen or bathroom or something. They tried to stick a bathroom fan uh, with a vent directly. I'm going to let that go. That's fine. Um, maybe an old prior leak somewhere. Um, it's not leaking now and the roof looked great. Um, but watermarks, I'm going to make sure that's in the report and I'm going to put it as a monitoring recommended. It could leak during a rainstorm. I don't know. I didn't see anything on the roof and I'm not going back. I'm not going to try to diagnose and evaluate. And this is a forensic uh, inspection. I'm not trying to figure out what happened in the past, when, or if it's actively now or and document, you know, all that stuff. I'm just here to observe anything that's actively leaking. Obviously, it ain't wet. It's not actively leaking. But it looks like it, something in the past happened. There's only really only one person who can comment on this. It ain't me. It's the homeowner. So I'm going to put in a report, monitor this area. It looked like it leaked in the past. And then I divert responsibility. I ask my client to ask the homeowner for more information about this. Some homeowners have no idea. Some do and just forgot to disclose it. That's kind of fun too. So I'm looking at insulation, insulation that all looks good, all looks great. And then I realized, oh yeah, I came up through, came up into the attic through a pull down stairs. And this is trust built roof. So I've got a cord here, got a cord here, got, got all these components and fastening. And I've got a bottom cord here that has been cut. You can't cut cords. There was a, there was a bottom cord here in the truss. This is a structural member. You can't just cut a big, you can't just cut four trusses to make room for something, right? Now, the house ain't going to fall down. The roof ain't going to fall down. It's been standing like this probably for 20 years. I get all that. But the standard is you ain't supposed to cut a truss. This is an engineered component of the roof structural system. And this has been modified in the field by some contractor or homeowner in order to stick a big hole, uninsulated, by the way, in the ceiling of the second floor. So I actually have to have a structural engineer what do I say? What do I say? It doesn't matter. I got it. It's in my attic. <laughs> it's, I know exactly what to say. Uh, roof component was roofs. Ah, oh, shoot. Uh, here it is. Well, if you want my template, I can send it to you. But 
there's an engineered trust component that was modified in the field. So we now need somebody to take a look at it and name me to structural engineer to give it an okay or fix something or put it back the way it was. I don't know. Not my job. My job is to report upon defects that I both observe and deem to be major. That's my responsibility. And I've got one here. So no big deal. No one's going to get immediately hurt. There's no imminent collapse coming in the next five minutes. So I have to handle it in a professional manner. I'm not going to come down out of this attic yelling and screaming. I'm going to clearly, I, I, I'm going to have a conversation. I'm going to tell the story about this roof truss, right? And let my client decide what to do. There was this little attic, side attic uh, I found, and I opened it up and uh, it looks good. I can't crawl in there. You know, it's lots of insulation, but it looked okay. If there's no floor, I'm not crawling in there. I'm not falling through. Um, I have fallen through ceilings before, but I'm not going to do that. Bathrooms, I group all the bathrooms together. I flush the toilet, run the sink, pound on the tile walls, try to make something leak. So I'll direct the shower into a corner and I'll see if I can get it to leak, you know, in that corner there. And it actually did. So I got this shower. Hot water always works really well for me. I directed it in this corner. I didn't think it was going to leak, but it actually did. And there's water puddling coming up. I saw a little, you know, mark and I thought, oh, let's, let's just give it a try. And so it leaked. I'm not repairing it. I didn't cause a lot of damage or anything like that, but it did leak. And so I'm going to put in a report as correction recommended. That's kind of cool. That's the second bathroom. There's the metal sink we were talking about earlier. And um, it's cracked. It's not actively dripping, but I bet it will if I fill it up. So that sink needs to be replaced. I'm going to grab these um, hand holds and I'm going to pound on the towel walls, see if anything happens. I'm going to direct the shower to see if anything leaks. There's a GFCI. I'm going to test that GFCI. And the fan didn't turn on because um, it was unplugged, right? So I thought, well, let me plug it in. So I plugged it in and it still didn't work. So the fan needs to be replaced. And there's the plumbing access panel behind here. This is an inspection restriction. I don't move furniture. First floor bathroom, half bath. There's the chrome plated soft brass. It's a P trap. I mean, sorry, it's an S trap. So it's going to gurgle. No big deal. And there's the fan. And now I'm interior and I'm heading to the kitchen. Can't wait to get to the kitchen. It's representative number of things, windows, doors, receptacles, smoke detectors. I got one fogged window. There's one thing I use my finger a lot. I don't have time to draw arrows or put text on pictures. So it's one fogged window and two fogged window panes. Easy fixes, nothing wrong really. Well, here's a safety issue. I really don't care how tall this is. It's tall enough for a small child or baby to crawl through. I've had kids, three of them, and hurt themselves. So, um, you know, we don't, the house was built to code back then, sure. Yeah, there's no handrail here. But if my client has a ch small child and it crawls around, and I forgot to tell them about this, that they can fall through here. I don't care if the house is built a code back then. What I want to do is help my client currently. And if they have a small kid, this railing may not be all that safe because it's the space is large enough for a child to fall through. The standard, the code, we don't use the word code. The standard is no more than a four inch spear pass through any part of this railing. And usually it's like, oh, that's the deck. That's outside. That's, that's not inside. Yeah, it's inside too right? Oh, it, it has to be 30 inches tall. Well, you know, I'm not going to measure this. I know that a little baby falling through and falling here. Yeah. I don't care if it's 30 inches. I don't care if it's 29 and it doesn't count. And then if my client is really old, I had a client, she couldn't walk one step without a handrail, without help. So this one, two, three risers, you need a handrail here for my client. Now that's not to code. Code says four or more risers. I don't care. I'm not a code inspector, thank goodness. I'm a home inspector. I can say just about anything that favors my client to make sure that they're safe and my client needs a handrail. I'm gonna put that in a report. The reality is it won't get fixed. 
No one's going to fix it. No one's going to. No one's going to replace that railing until someone gets hurt. No one's going to put in a handrail until my client falls down steps. But I got to do it anyways. I got to tell them you really should. If you can't do one step without a handrail, then you're you're going to have trouble going into your living room from the entry door. Is the a split level kind of like, you know, they're going to go up there. So you need a handrail. I'm going to put that in a report. I'm going to put this in a report. And that's our job. We don't know. We don't follow up on our recommendations. We don't know if they made all the repairs. But in my agreement, I tell my client, I'm making recommendations. And I want you to follow those recommendations before you buy the home. Because if you buy the home after, and then you make those repairs later, I, I, I don't know what's going to happen, right? The contractor may come in and find more problems that are behind the wall that I couldn't see during an inspection. It's not right. my responsibility. So you kind of miss that opportunity to fix things before you move in. This may be a good opportunity for my client to understand some safety things, some opportunities to make things more safe, like interior key deadbolts can make an emergency exit difficult, especially if there's a fire and smoke. No one can find the key. Throw this thing away and stick a nice modern latch in there so it's safe. I'm in the kitchen, looking great. I run hot and cold water at the sink with a dish sprayer, garbage disposal, turn that on. And then, whoops, I got two buckets underneath the sink <laughs> and I couldn't get them to leak. And I'm not sure why they're there. There was no water in them, but it's really a dumb idea for a seller to leave buckets underneath a water fixture just before a home inspector comes. So I had to do this whole thing where I, I couldn't get it to leak, but I'm recommending you monitor this area and ask the seller if the fixture ever leaked before in the past. So if I could get it to leak, that'd be great. I understand why the buckets are there, but I don't understand why the, the two buckets are there. So that was kind of funny. And then um, test the GFCIs, uh, make sure the stove doesn't tip over, turn on all the burners. You can't really see, but I've got all the four burners and the, the oven is on as well. I'm not going to cook everything. You know, they put, they put things in here. So I'm just going to turn the oven on and then turn it right off. And one of the things I do is I don't let go of the door handle. Don't let, don't turn on the oven and then get distracted. So um, that's one of the things there. And then we have a, a microwave and I can turn that on and use the microwave detector from InterNACHI and let that flash. And then dishwasher. Again, if it leaks, it's not my problem, but I'll do a short cycle. And then I do infrared. It's beyond the standards of practice. A lot of things are beyond the standards of practice, like kitchen, right? But I'm gonna do a little shot of infrared while I go around. It's a lot of fun. And there is something here, right? It's hot outside and there's like a lack of insulation because it's it's a, actually a warm and it's hot and this isn't insulated at all. So this is like a heat, this is on fire, right? Over hundred degrees. So that's that, like, it looks okay, but I get to see things that other inspectors don't, right? So this looks really cool, but actually it could use some insulation because they screwed up the insulation up in the attic, remember? So I get to see things that other inspectors don't. This is on fire. These areas are not insulated at all, right? And so it kind of feels different in this area. Maybe in the wintertime, it just feels like a, like a cold draft or something coming up. Or in the summertime, it feels like it's radiating from this area because there's no insulation in this area. So I get to see things that other inspectors can't see. And that's one of the reasons why you should hire me. Don't hire the inspector who sees what you see. Hire the inspector who sees things that other inspectors can't see. So grab an infrared camera. You can get an infrared camera for about 400 bucks. FLIR C3, C5, I love FLIR, you know. Um, there are other infrared cameras too, but it helps distinguish you from your competition and it actually makes you a better inspector as well. It's one of the things about marketing. You have to answer the question, why should I hire you? You got trained and certified. Now you're a certified inspector, big deal. So is everybody else. What makes you different from all the rest? You have to explain to me, to yourself, to your friend, why you should be hired instead of the next inspector. Maybe it's because you see things other inspectors can't see with the tools. Maybe you get up on the roof and the other ones you don't. Maybe you have a moisture meter 
You can find it. Maybe you get in the attic and they don't, right? Maybe you have a summary at the end of the inspection and the other inspectors don't, right? Okay. Yeah. I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the clear uh, camera. Yep. Uh, I, I've seen the, the cameras that you can hook to your uh, to your phone. Do you recommend those or have you used them? Yeah. Yeah. So here's a a FLIR one. I believe it's called a one. A FLIR one. Yeah. No, yeah. I've used it and um, it's okay. Um, I really like the FLIR C C three. Uh, where is that? It looks like um, it looks like a oh here it is. C two. Oh, this is an old one. They don't make this anymore. So this is my old, it's still kicking, a, a FLIR C2. And the imagery on this is really good. And I like it. I don't transfer images from this camera to uh, the report. I just take a picture. I use my phone. I hold this. Oh, let's see. How do I do this? Can you see me? I hold this and I use my camera and I take a picture like that. That's a really fast way of getting infrared pictures into your software, not this transfer stuff and Wi-Fi stuff. I've used this one, it's not that great. And it gets in my way because I write at the same time. So if I stick it in here, it actually doesn't connect because my case uh, gets in the way of the bottom connection. Okay. So this is, this is a great inexpensive thing, but it just doesn't, doesn't work for me. And I, I really like this way where I hold the camera like this and I take a picture. Good. Okay. That answers the question. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Brian asks one uh, online quick question on inspection fees. I'm considering raising my base fee, and I think I should base it on average fees being charged in my area or a national average. What are the average fees you're seeing? Um, I don't care. I don't care about that. I don't care what my competition is charging. You have to be able to calculate a profitable inspection fee using math. And chapter 11 of the International Home Inspection Business Course walks you through two inspectors, Mary and John, and they're trying to figure out what to charge. And we do a little math. And we figure out exactly what Inspector John and Inspector Mary need to, to um, charge. And it's based upon math. It, it's based upon market, sure and what your other competitors are doing that you meet in the chapter and, you know, but you really want to gauge whether they are dirt cheap low and you have to, you have to help them raise their price, right? Or if they're really expensive and they're doing well, maybe you're, maybe you're not charging enough, right? What, what value are they providing that they can charge $800 in inspection? Like there's, there's Jim Crum in Colorado, best in the home inspections. He charges $650 for a home inspection. Huh? That's a lot. That's What is he doing? I think he's going to be one of your instructors in Colorado. What is he doing to charge that much? We're all doing the same thing. We're all doing home inspections. According to a standards of practice, we're all doing the same stuff. Flashlight, GFCI tester, write a report. They all look about the same. How can one inspector make so much money than the others? And why is one inspector thinking that they can charge less? It's even good, you know, let's, let's drive this price way down. Let's do a $150 home inspection, right? So what you want to do is base your, base, um, price your services based upon the value of the service that you provide. You're selling based upon value. And to figure that out, it's marketing, and also you got to pay the bills, and it's math. You have to figure out what your desired annual salary is going to be, what your costs are for operating a home inspection company, overhead and monthly bills and all that stuff, and, uh, and a profit margin. Maybe you want 25% or 20% or something like that. You know? And then you figure out how, how many hours you want to work. Uh, are you willing to work 10 hour a day or eight hour a day or four or five, six days a week, something like that? And you figure all that out. That's math. And then you look at your competitors and figure out, well, what value are they providing? If everything is the same in a market, 
if every home inspector is absolutely the same, you're certified, you're trained, you have the same skill set, same experience, five years or whatever you've been doing, a thousand inspection or, or same, everything's the same, same services. The only, the only thing different would be price. And in that situation, the lowest price wins because the consumer is just going to buy that cheap inspector. And that's no good for anybody. So what you got to do is don't compete on price, but compete on value. Make sure you're, you got the math right. So you're not cheating yourself and you'll be out of money in six months. Make sure your price are right. But man, keep going up. Keep pushing the value up. At my company, I ran a, a company with my brother, founder of Internet Nick, um, in Philadelphia with a ton of competition in, in Philadelphia, right? Hundreds of really good inspectors. And what we did was we overwhelmed our clients with value in order to keep our prices up. And when I came home or came back to the office, I came back with $1,000 at least. Every inspector in our company made $1,000 every day, right? And we went through recession, depression, low, high, whatever. That was our goal, you know, because we focused on value. You got to really focus on your clients. What do they need? And then overwhelm them and then distinguish yourself from all the rest so that you're the only person, you're the only, I can't you're the only person that's different, right? Like, like uh, if you got everybody lined up, you know, the four of you in class, right? You line each other up. You have to ask yourself, okay, the first person who's certified, you know, the person who's certified, step, take one step forward. You would all take one step forward because you're going to be certified by the end of the week. You'll be a certified home inspector by the end of the week. Okay, who has an uh, infrared camera? Well, maybe one or two of you step forward. Um, who provides a, a home maintenance book for every client at the end of the inspection so they can maintain their home and also remind them to hire you again? Maybe only one or two step four, who uses ladders and one or two step four, who, you know, the person who can keep stepping forward distinguishes every, leaves everybody else behind to the point where it, no one even sees you, sees your competition. They're way behind. Yeah, they're cheap. If someone calls me up and say, hey, I'm looking for, uh, yep, I charge $396. Uh, that's, that's really pricing. I said, well, you know, I'll give them some value elevator pitch and then I'll tell them exactly where to find the cheapest inspector. Cheap, really cheap. You know, I got that list for you if you want. I don't want you as a client. I want them as a client. You got to say no sometimes, but you give them to the cheapest inspector because you're going to get what you pay for in this industry. You got to find really good inspectors who know how to charge based upon the value that they provide uh let's see china uh, do you carry around a four inch sphere to test terry asks do you carry around a four inch sphere to test those railings no i carry around my my measuring tape and it's a little guy too i hate those big fat heavy uh things i'm not measuring 25 feet right i wish they made these even smaller so i'm testing four inches right so um i use this and also i just met a fella i was at the florida Association of Builders and Inspectors Conference, Fabby Conference, and he, Sean, he makes some, uh, I'm going to find it and then promote it in the newsletter. You better, it's going to be in the newsletter, so you better subscribe to the newsletter. It's a disc, and he, he uh, was it, 3, 3D laser creates this thing, and it's a disc, and then this dimension is four inches, and then this dimension is six inches, and then it's a six and a quarter inches. I don't know how he does it, and you stick it in there because the Spongy spheres. Look at this thing. This thing is packed. This, this thing is packed, man. If I put a, there's no room for a, if I took a four inch foam sphere out of here, it would all be crunched out. It wouldn't be a sphere, it'd be a flat pancake. So those foam things are nice, but in reality, doing inspections to a day or something and throwing your tools in a bag and throw them in your truck, um, that spongy foam thing doesn't work very well. Um, let's say anything else. Any questions? Who has a business name in the in the class and online? Who has a business name? Anybody have a business name? Or are you still thinking about business names? 
Still thinking. I work for a company that already has a name. So. Okay. And they sent you to get trained and certified? Yes, sir. What's the name of the company? Uh, National Property Inspections. Ah, NPI. Yeah, yes, there's sir. about a thousand of you with the same name. <laughs> yeah. Good job. Great. You, you have established yourself in that line of everybody else, right? What you want to do is go to Nenachi's marketing team, right? I'm not bashing MPI. They're a great, great, great uh, company, and they've got really nice uh, resources and all that stuff. But for the other three, right, you want to go to Nenachi's marketing team and use their business consultants. Free advice. You have six professionals in the internet marketing team, and they just wait for people to ask them questions about marketing. What do I do next is your question for the marketing team. Jessica is the director of marketing. And you ask her, what do I do next? And she'll say, do you have a business name? No. Well, let's think of one. Like, what comes to mind? Like, and we'll go through a half a dozen business names that are unique and maybe part of your brand. You know my brand. Where is my brand? Where is my share my screen? Share my screen. AJ, tell me to shut up if I'm just bothering people. Big Ben Inspections. This is my brand, okay? This is the website. I'm certified and I have a buyback and I found, you found the best inspector in Raleigh because that is what my clients need. They need to find the best inspector in Raleigh and it's Big Ben. So I'm, you know, I stand like this in every picture and my logo is like that as well. And it's so easy to remember that my clients can just Google search me and find me. Big Ben Inspections. Yeah. And there's no one else with that name. There's no other Big Ben. Right. Now, National Property Inspectors. Let's just go for it. Google. I, I think one of the most creative ones was Octopus Inspections. That was really good. And he wrapped his entire vehicle in an octopus. And you say that 10 times, you'll never forget. You'll always, if you're a real estate agent and you're trying to remember which, oh, I need an inspection right now, octopus inspections, right? You'll remember that. National, national, oh, I can't type it. This is another reason why you don't property inspections. What, what happens when I do that? Well, oh, these are ads. So if you want on page one, you know, or when you need a website, go to natchee.org slash website, and you can run an ad to be on page one, right? Oh, National Property Inspections, nippyweb.com, nippyweb, nippyweb.com, Premier Inspection Service, find an inspector, I got to find, I thought it just did, find an inspector uh, and zip code. Uh, 27603 is Raleigh. I got one guy in Raleigh. Cool. I guess I'll, oh, now I got to visit his, visit my website. I got to visit his website. Okay. It's four clicks in. I'm done. That's just me. Like it's too many clicks. I just want to visit Big Ben Inspections, you know, and get to you. Know, so um, if you want to think about like asking NPI for something that distinguishes you from all the rest, you may want to like do that because you don't want to be the same. I don't want to pick on MPI or you, but the, the it's a great example of like, you need to distinguish yourself from all the rest, right? You need to be different. You need to answer the question. Like tonight, I would say your homework is answer the question, why should I hire you next week after you become certified? Why should I hire you instead of the other guy who charges cheaper? You know, so if you go through that mental exercise, you'll start to figure out it has a lot more than, than to do than just doing a home inspection. Doing a home inspection is pretty straightforward. After you become certified, after you know how to do a home inspection, you go through the house of horrors four times, you know, do those mock inspection reports through the house of horrors four times, inspect your home 10 times. Inspect if you're in a hotel room tonight, you're taking a class or you're in an apartment or a condo or a townhome, I don't care where you are. You have to inspect your home, inspect your bathroom 10 times tonight using some kind of checklist. Internet is a free checklist, by the way. We have a free checklist. You can use a free software. You can use it. It's very basic. Don't use it for clients. Use it for your training. And inspect the bathroom. 
inspect that system. What's in the bathroom? Components. You turn each component on and all together, it makes a system. And that system in that bathroom should be five minutes max. You have to manage your time. You should be able to inspect that bathroom, find problems that exist or not, they don't exist, and make that report in about five minutes. You have to get that fast and efficient. Shouldn't be a big deal. And you have to just practice. Yeah. Now that's not going to distinguish you from all the rest that you can inspect the bathroom really fast, right? And efficiently. It, the rest of it is about marketing, even logo, logo design, and flyers, and website, and messaging. It's called a brand. What distinguishes you? You use infrared. Okay, when we need to, we need to take advantage of that, right? We got to put in your, you got to be infrared certified. Use that logo. Put that logo on your business card. Put that logo on your website. Put pictures of you using infrared on your website. In your flyer. Do videos of you, selfie videos of you using infrared. Hey, I've just found this using my infrared camera. Call me, Big Ben Inspections, Raleigh, North Carolina. Right? Take a picture. Write a blog about infrared. Write a blog. A blog could be 50 words in a paragraph, a couple sentences. About, and then you stick a picture in your blog, on your website. Now you got all this content that supports how credible you are as a home inspector who's different from all the rest. This person sees things that other inspectors don't see and uses this inf infrared fancy thing, right? Don't be the same as everybody else. You have to be different and provide an incredible value that just overwhelms your clients. And that's the fun thing about being a home inspector and running your own business. So you four in the classroom, you're gonna be overwhelmed in the next few days. I have certified master inspectors coming and also vendors coming, and they're gonna train you on certain things, inspecting a home in detail, but don't get overwhelmed, right? I'm available, staff is available, and we have all of these systems for you to take advantage of and delegate down to. Don't do your own marketing. Let a team of professionals handle your marketing and all that design work is free. Education, you're not sure which class to take to get certified in additional inspections in your area because like um, mold inspections don't work and radon isn't all over the country. Termites, you know, you have to be licensed maybe in your state or something like that. So you have to pick your ancillary inspections to increase gross revenue. Ask the education team what ancillary inspections should, and there's six people in the education team. Take advantage of that. What class should I take next? Where should I, I be certified next? And if you ever need help about business, marketing, doing inspections, I'm always available. I've got a ton of energy. I answer every email. Uh, don't call me, email me. And um, I'm on the contact page because this is, I just love helping inspectors be successful. And you could be new and you could be a veteran inspector. Um, I'll help you up for sure. Get to where you want to be. And I think that's about it. Looks like we've, We've done about an hour and something. Yeah. If you have any more questions, you can email me, okay? Ben at internachi.org. All right, everybody. Bye. Thank you.